The Lifestylist, episode 161, featuring Danielle Laporte. I'm Luke Story, a former celebrity fashion stylist and founder of School of Style. For the past 20 years, I've been relentlessly dedicated to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of health and spirituality. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. The podcast you're listening to right now is made possible in part by my friends over at Juve. Now, if you've been listening to the show for a while or following me on social media, you've probably seen me using red light therapy or at least talking about it. It's something that's technically referred to as photobiomodulation, and it's arguably the most well-researched biohack that I currently use, seriously. There's over 3,000 published clinical papers on light therapy. What's even more compelling is that over 200 of them are double-blinded, randomized, and placebo-controlled. In short, that means that they've been proven to work. So some of the benefits include improved skin health, increased muscle recovery, better sexual performance, and reduced joint pain and inflammation. So you can see why I'm such a big fan of the red light therapy. And that's why all my friends now come over to my house on a regular basis wanting to use my Juve device. So that's my favorite current application. And if you want to check it out, you can go to juve.com forward slash Luke. That's J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash Luke. And if you enter the code Luke at checkout, you're going to receive a free gift. So as I said, this is one of my favorite biohacks. It feels good. It's fast. It's easy. It's something you can stack with other modalities. Red light therapy is the future. And you can find out all about it at juve.com forward slash Luke. Today's show is brought to you by Four Sigmatic. Now, you guys know I'm always talking about their medicinal mushroom elixirs because I take them all the time. I'm super addicted to them. But now they've got a couple other products that I'm really into. They've got a decaf coffee for when I don't feel like freaking out on caffeine. And then they have a regular coffee, but not just coffee. Both of them are infused with medicinal mushrooms. So it's a mushroom coffee. They're fantastic. They've also got some matcha drinks like the matcha with lion's mane. And the thing that's cool about the Four Sigmatic drinks is they're totally organic. They're super powerful herbs and superfoods and mushrooms, but they're really easy to use. That's the issue I've had, like trying to be healthy and making myself some cool drinks is that it's kind of a pain in the ass and I have to open up all these different containers and it's a big project. Their products come in these little packets. You just pop them open. They're very portable. I take them on the plane. I take them on trips. I keep them in my bag, in my car. I kind of have them all over the house. And I can just use them whenever I want. So Four Sigmatic, one of my favorite companies. If you want to check them out, I highly recommend that you do. To do that, you go to foursigmatic.com. And like all of my sponsors, they offer a sweet discount to the listeners. If you use the code LUKESTORY, you will save 15% off your order, which is a pretty good deal. So go to foursigmatic.com, enter the code LUKESTORY and save 15%. Check it out. The vibration currently making boom, boom with your eardrums is the sound of the Lifestylist podcast. My name is Luke Story. I'm the host of this here show. And today I'm going to deliver to you Danielle Laporte. This is not an episode, but rather an experience and one that I know you're going to benefit from immensely. I sat down with Danielle at the Longevity Now conference a few months ago and recorded this really fun, really deep and profound talk. And I've been sitting on it for a few months waiting for the right moment to strike. And guess what? Today is the right moment. So here we go. But before we jump into the details of this episode with Danielle Laporte, let's talk about next week's episode so that you don't miss that. It's the ultimate guide to the power of crystals with Energy Muse. So if you're someone who's been wondering what's up with those crazy colorful rocks and gems, do they actually do anything or is it all a bunch of woo-woo nonsense. You're going to find out next Tuesday. But here's what you have to do in order to find out. You've got to subscribe to the show. So reach down right now and hit the subscribe button on whatever device you're listening to my voice on. 
I've got a couple of great upcoming events. I'll be speaking at Mercado Sagrado. It's one of my favorite events here in Los Angeles. It's in Malibu Canyon on October 13th and 14th. Not only, however, will I be doing a talk, but I'm also going to be presenting Luke's Biohacking Lounge. And let me tell you what is going to be insane. I'm going to be there for the whole weekend, just bringing people into the craziest vortex of all things healing and consciousness technology. So that's Mercado Sagrado, October 13th and 14th. Then I'll be heading out to New York City shortly after that, where I'll be doing some panels and all kinds of other hijinks at Whitma Live, my third time at Whitma, second time in New York. That's October 25th. And then finally, I'll be at Rama, New York City on the Lower East Side, October 27th to celebrate my birthday, two days early technically. And I'll be doing a spiritual workshop there. We're going to be doing some yoga, some breath work, meditation. We're going to be going deep into the zone, guys. This is going to be uh, my spiritual coming out party. I decided this year <laughs> I'm tired of playing small. And you know what? I'm actually very inspired by our guest, Danielle, too, as you're going to hear in this in this uh, episode. But uh, Rama is one of my favorite places to do kundalini yoga in LA. And I'm really excited to do my first workshop of this kind there, October 27th. If you want to come to any of the events that I just mentioned, you can easily find them at lukestory.com forward slash events. On to today's show. Daniela Port is a speaker, a poet, painter, and a former business strategist and Washington, D.C. think tank executive. That sounds very serious. <laughs> it's hard to imagine that sitting down with her because we just had such a spiritual vibe going. I don't know how she ever fit in in D.C. Maybe she didn't. That's why she got out. We'll find out. She's also the author of White Hot Truth, the Firestarter Sessions, and the Desire Map. And she's also host of a podcast called Lightwork, which is great. You should definitely go check it out. So as I said, I recorded this one at the Longevity Now conference, and I was so excited to be able to grab Danielle right after she spoke to a standing ovation crowd. I missed her talk because I was recording with someone else, unfortunately, but everyone tells me it was fantastic. I was lucky enough to sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one talk with her, and it was just, it was just amazing, man. I mean, she's just... A true Renaissance woman, you know. Today, the world is full of spiritual gurus and teachers, and uh, you know, you throw a rock here in LA, and you can hit one <laughs> blindly. But I've got to say, my favorite teachers are the ones that have not yet arrived, but the ones that are sharing the journey with you, and that's the type of teacher Danielle is. And we just had a really heartfelt, empathy-filled, super gooey sit-down conversation. I can't wait to share it with you. Here's what we talk about in the episode. Getting addicted to self-help, why narcissism is such a painful trap that doesn't blend well with spirituality, how to avoid being pseudo-spiritual, the overuse and misuse of the word guru, how and why Danielle created Lighter, a one-year soul support program, how self-help often devolves into self-criticism, why we're addicted to our phones, and how we keep justifying the addiction, guilty as charged being successful without being stuck in the lower states of desire and wantingness, taking responsibility for your feelings and quitting the victim game, cultivating an open, tender heart with a big effing fence, using the human body as a tuning fork for truth, the power of eye gazing with an open heart to appreciate someone you love, maintaining faith in goodness when life seems dark, considering the point of view of the soul's evolutionary purpose, the relationship between spiritual maturity and softness, why Danielle stays in touch with her feminine energy at all times, and finally, Danielle's bag of meditation tricks and finding the right practice for you. So as you can see, this is going to be an enlightening conversation, and I encourage you to stay through to the end because it just keeps getting better and better. So sit back, put on some headphones, relax, and enjoy this journey with Danielle Laporte. Danielle, welcome to the Lifestylist Podcast. I am happy to be... This was like a surprise. But great surprise. I love it. Yeah. It was a surprise to you to be asked to be on the show while we're here at the Longevity Now conference. Yeah. And I was so pleasantly uh, surprised when I introduced myself. You went, oh, I know you. I listened to your podcast. Yeah. That was so awesome. 
Totally. It's neat to get to the point where I don't have to like hard pitch myself to people to get them to sit down for an interview. Because <laughs> it's like when I was here two years ago, I was like, hey, I have, I'm starting this podcast. It's not out yet. Can I interview you? And, you yeah. know, people, some people humored me and I got some big names and stuff like that. But it's nice to not have to like work that hard. So yeah. I'm really happy to sit down and talk to you. Me too. You uh, unfortunately, I missed your talk because I was doing an interview. It is unfortunate. I, was, I would have rocked your world. I yeah. hear that from my friends, but I was interviewing uh, William Davis and learning all about why I really, I knew this, but why I should really, really not eat gluten, mm -hmm. which I, I kind mm -hmm. of knew. But once I talked to him, it was, mm -hmm. it was really disappointing because now I can't even get away with my little cheats. First thing is what's up with your new book, White Hot Truths? Uh, it's sitting there marinating. It's baking. I think it's working on some people in a good way. I'm um, hearing more conversations about addiction as self-help. And just sort of relaxing and taking some of the self-help to-do lists off the plate. Yeah. I was going to actually ask you about that. That's great. So do you think that within the community of people that are making an effort to grow spiritually, to do self-help, as we call it, personal development, that there is a risk or a propensity to become narcissistic and self-obsessed in trying to fix oneself and get to the next level rather than they're just kind of allowing you to explore your humanity and have that experience without always trying to like fix, fix, fix? I don't think you become narcissistic, narcissistic from rabid pursuit. I think it might just be affirming some of your wounds and your lack thinking and self-worth kind of stuff. But I think if you're a narcissist, it started long before you got hooked on wanting to improve yourself. Right. Yeah. And there's like a real distinction to make. I mean, narcissism really is a disease of feeling less than. And there's a righteousness that comes with it. Mm -hmm. And so for all of the narcissistic behavior, notice like... I behavior, not narcissistic people. It's a, th right. you know, and there's a spectrum right. to it, right? So I think- I live in Hollywood, so I'm well aware right. of the spectrum. <laughs> if you're high on the narcissistic spectrum and you claim to be, I mean, I think everybody's on a spiritual path, but you're kind of going the holistic way, there's, there can be like this divisiveness, this arrogance that happens. Like, let me tell you how long I meditate for. Let me tell you how deep my down dog was this week. It's just, it's just like, I'm going to keep positioning myself, myself where, you know. Yeah, did that answer that question? It does. And actually, it leads me into another um, phenomenon that I've been interested in because I have gone through the various phases of my own growth. And, and that's one where you build a spiritual ego. Yeah. You know, you start to work on yourself spiritually and then the ego is sort of there in the shadows going, ah, ha, 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 this mm -hmm. is great. <laughs> I'm going to mm -hmm. take the stuff that you're learning mm -hmm. and all of, you know, the, the wisdom that you're reading and getting from gurus. And now I'm going to, the ego says, I'm going to take on the voice and now use that to get attention mm -hmm. and to get approval. Well, you're running the risk of being a spiritual douche. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, that's why I love your work. <laughs> like you're able to keep it real, which is so fun. But at the same time, like, the video, that, your work, I mostly know from video. And uh, now I'm going to listen to your podcast though, especially because that's such a dope cover. But I like where you go and where some people are going that are delivering personal development, self-help, spiritually oriented work, but doing it with a sense of humor and not being so uptight about it. Mm -hmm. I find that, that relatable aspect of your work very cool. Real life. These are the conversations I have with my girlfriends, give or take. Mm -hmm. And so it's everything like, relationships and I then this meditation and and how do I protect myself with we shouldn't eat kale any kale has oscillates you need <laughs> yeah, to get totally, off the kale totally. too much of it you know right yeah and I'm a Joe on the journey yeah, yeah. well I think yeah. that's the appeal of your work is that you're not you don't have the guru status of like okay I've arrived I'm, I don't want the guru I'm status. an enlightened being and I'm going to tell you how to get here Listen. you're you're more like, hey, I'm on the journey. Come along the journey with me. Would, would that be and an accurate it, description? Yes. And you know what it takes to be have that guru status? Like, I don't want that karma. I don't want that weight. I don't want to have to protect myself to that extent. Even the, the term guru is misused, overused. And the whole point, I mean, this is my revelation. The whole point is to be your own guru. And I mean, it, what, what White Hot Truth is all about is really going, it's, it's almost like 
maybe I should have called it like guru detox because it's about creating space to hear your own voice. You know, I just saying when I was on stage earlier, you know, let's treat this like it was an AA meeting. My name is Danielle. Everybody says Danielle. Say thank you. It has been, this is accurate. I had to think about it. It has been 13 months since I had a psychic reading. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And like no right. coach. I got a shrink. I have an energy worker. But that's it. Like I haven't had a channeling What's in a long time. What's the last time you uh, read your horoscope? Well, hor- horoscope plays in. Yeah, horoscope <laughs> plays in. But like I haven't had an astrology reading. Right. Uh, there's been no channeling. There's been no tarot throwing. Right. And when you first decide you're going to clean up in that way, you know, there's like sweaty palms. Oh, I should refer to, ask, get some insight on this decision. No, I have spaciousness now. I save a lot of money. Got a lot more time on my calendar. And my mistakes are mine. And my victories are mine and shared with a few other people. I was looking at your Instagram and you had a post uh, about uh, Russell Brand's book. You know, yeah. his like recovery book, his interpretation of the 12 steps, which I have not read. I used to see him quite a bit at, at Kundalini Yoga uh, at Golden Bridge in LA. And he's funny. We had a lot in common in terms of our perspective and history uh, in recovery. But you you alluded to in your post, you said, I'm, I'm working on a project that mm-hmm. is, you know, I'm so I'm researching the 12 steps. Was that for this book mm. that you're referring no, to or is that this another is a, thing? This is a really recent thing. Oh, okay. So I'm doing a year long program, which is a new thing for me because normally... I stay in my turret and I just write, I put it out and then I go back into hiding, like extreme introvert, just want to quietly do my thing. And I feel, I don't know if the word is called, it's like this craving to be with people in a way that I haven't felt before. It's like, we really need to get together, to use the overused word, in tribe, to be clear, to support each other, to have our sanity validated. Yeah. And so I need, I feel like I need to, I want to do that just as a person. And I feel that that's like, that's the next way for me to serve. So that's a long way of saying, I'm going to do this year long program called Lighter. And part of doing that was I asked. An offering that people can participate in. You sign up, you get a beautiful thing in the mail and we'll hang out together for 12 months. And part of creating that was I asked a gazillion people, what do you crave? What do you really want? How do you think I could help? Overwhelmingly, I'm addicted to my fucking phone. Yeah. And I want check. better friendships. <laughs> yeah, check and check. <laughs> I got the friendships on lock, but the phone thing, wow. But it was amazing how the responses, it was like, they were like braided together. Friends, phone, friends, phone. It just... Right. Because you're so, to, you got your head so deep in right. your damn phone that you're not having real intimacy and relationships with do live you remember, people. You just used to go to the cafe. And you met sure. with people. Well, I went to the bar, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the dealer's house, but yeah, I digress. <laughs> and and you didn't text each other. On the, You were just, you were there. You showed up. Right. And you, whether you were inebriated or you were like totally present, there was like more interacting. Like we know we're addicted. This isn't anything. Yeah. This isn't an epiphany. Uh, so, but back to where Russell Brand and the 12 steps come in. So addiction has never been my thing at least as far as I know, but I, I'm addicted to my phone and I'm addicted to the dopamine hit that I'm getting from the little heart and the like. And the trick is so I can justify the addiction it's because your business. I need it for my business. Oh, me too. Yeah. And, Amen, I also, sister. <laughs> and I also, you know, the, the, with the 12 steps, whatever number step it is about admitting you are powerless. One. That's step one. That's the first, that's the thing that gets you in the door. Yeah. I'm fucked already Yeah. because I'm just, I'm not, I'm not powerless. I am master of my domain. Right. I'm a clear thinking, you know, no, I'm actually not powerless over my phone. So what I'm going to do with, with, just with that one track of what I'm calling it as the, the intention is to get in right relationship with technology. And I think we're going to do the 12 steps or some... Oh, that's amazing. Some Danielified version of that's that. That's cool because that was one thing I wanted to ask you about as an entrepreneur, businesswoman who's using media and social media to promote and sell and market and everything that you are. Yeah. Like, 
how do you do that in a low touch capacity and still be effective? I mean, as you can see, I've got Instagram live, Facebook yeah. live, a YouTube Hi. camera. Hi. We have your Hi. camera going. Hi. I mean, I can very easily justify, and I've had to do this in, you know, with, in relationships with women. They're like, you're always on your phone. I'm like, it's my business. That's always my out. Yeah. But I was going to ask yeah. you, you know, how you, is it one of those Okay, so I don't drink, right? Because when I drink, I gather I go to jail. Okay, <laughs> it's just I'm allergic to it. What, I, I what happens I, to you when you drink? I break out in handcuffs. <laughs> you know, I break out in track marks. That's another <laughs> issue. Um, you know what happens? I have one drink and I just immediately lose the thought that was like, Luke, tonight just have the one, and I just literally like can't stop the minute I start, and I'm going to drink until I'm on the floor, and then at mm. that point I'm going to call someone. We used to page them. But I'm, mm-hmm. I've been sober since cell phones came out. It's been 21 years. Mm-hmm. But once I'm on the floor, then I'm like, I need Coke. I need to wake mm-hmm. up so I can drink more. And then I do Coke and then I do this and I do that. And next thing you know, like it's bad. It's bad news. But here's the thing. With that type of addiction that's acute and the consequences are so dire, relationships lost, health lost, people get hurt, people die. There's hospitals, there's jails, there's injuries. It's just horrendous in my particular case. But with the phone or with sex or with food, these are things that are part of our life. Social media is part of your life. You know? mm-hmm. So how do we m- moderate things that we have to do anyway if we have a propensity toward addiction or habituation to that thing? Well, the first question is, do you really have to do it? Do you have to do it anyway? Like, Do you need to check your Facebook 50 times a day. (laughs) Do you need to, I mean, part of my addiction is posting and then going to see how many people love me. Of course. See, I love that you admit that. That's what's so dope about it. I watch the likes, but here's the problem. I'm watching the likes come in. It's 11 o'clock and then it's 11.15 PM and then it's 11.30. I have a, a whole thing around FOMO and sleeping. And so then I have to build a new dream for myself. I want to be healthy. I want to be thin. I want to feel sexy. I want to be clear-minded. I need 7.5 hours of sleep every night in order to do that. So that's got to be more important than the likes. Yeah. And because I'm clear, I have addictive... I'm trying to slightly wiggle out of this. I have addictive behaviors around my phone. I know that I have to sleep with my phone outside of my bedroom. I can't. Do you do that? Yep. Oh man, you're my hero. See, I have an excuse there because I use my phone you know as my how big it is. as my alarm and my yeah. sleep tracker. And so I'm like, well, I have to have it in my room. Okay, well, guess what? An alarm clock is 10 bucks. <laughs> right, right. There's some things like, and this will be one of the steps we have to begin on is like, imagine your life pre-cell phone. What are, what are all the things, the little things you need to get in place in order to live without that? Right. I think, you know, I've got an extra iPhone kicking around. Yeah. <laughs> Just like you hide a bottle. Yeah. But I think I'm going to use that cell just for phone calls when I leave the house so that I'm not checking my Instagram when I'm cashing out at the grocery store right. and being rude and disconnected. And, you know, like now I'm like taking little surveys wherever I go. It's like, I was just in the grocery store the other day. I say to the girl, anybody talk to you anymore? No, not really. Oh, oh that's so sad. God, tragic. <laughs> that just hurt my heart. I was like, yeah. oh. Yeah, That's really true. Yeah. That reminds me of something that I read of yours, a post recently, and it was about uh, good manners. Yeah, It was really funny. And I, that's another thing. I was like, oh, I like her realness. And uh, one of them was, don't be the person that's talking on your phone. Like, we can all hear you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just like, that's so true. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I think, that. I mean, there's just the rude, unconscious guy who just is loud, doesn't get it. To be honest, it, it, not to be sexist here against my own gender, but it usually is the guy too on the airplane. It's totally. And the they're dudes. always making big deals. I told you, let's put a hundred grand down, yep. Bill. You know, yeah, they're like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And they're like, mm-hmm. you were like, okay, you're a CEO. We get it, douche. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> take, <laughs> take, mm-hmm. take a rest. But then there's the rest of us who are just like, I'm just having a regular conversation on my phone. Right. Just like I would be if you were sitting next to me. But the thing is, we actually can hear you. And it's right. not a regular conversation. And just stop. Right. Yeah. 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 Where over. did you come up with your, your good manners thing? Oh, just uh, uh, excessively high standards. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Four planets in Virgo. Yeah. Is your main sign Virgo? No, I'm a Gemini. Oh, Gemini okay. sun. Oh, and okay. then all that Virgo means must be of service. Yeah. Yeah. And that's your career. Must be organized. 
It's a yeah. lot of white space. My house is very white. Is it? It's the Virgo, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Both of my parents are Virgos. That's why I asked. I'm very familiar with that species. <laughs> I love them, but they're definitely unique. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to success, I mean, I get the sense that you're crushing it. Like you're making money, you're doing well, I, you know, in terms of like material world success, mm-hmm. which I very much respect and am hoping to do more of myself. How do you reconcile your work around like achievement and goal setting and like kicking ass and making money and building your online programs, doing whatever it is that you do and not getting caught up in that sort of lower state of desire and wanting and mm-hmm. feeling as though you can't feel fulfilled until you get this or achieve that? Mm. Well, I'm really clear on how I want to feel, which is what my second last book is all about the desire map. So you get clear on your core desired feelings and then everything is in service to generating that. So I don't have these outside goals. It's not, I want a million on Facebook and I want to make X amount of money. It's that I want to feel in communion. Like right now, my current core desired feelings, they hang out for about a year. Love, euphoria, team. Uh, I don't tell anybody this, but I'll tell you. Uh, Oh, yay. Queen is a core desired feeling. Wow. And do you have a man in your life glowing. or a woman in your life that No, that I would helps? choose a man and I currently okay. do not have a king. Okay. Do you think that that sense of queenness is reliant? how much of that is reliant or supported by a mate? And how much of it is well, cultivated once the mate within shows oneself? Up, then there's there's lots to, there's lots of the queenness that could get fed. Mm-hmm. But my queenness has to be not reliant at all on anybody. And this is the whole idea. Like I'm in the driver's seat of how I want to feel. It's up to me to find euphoria. It's up to me to find radiance. And yeah, I mean, you know, reciprocity is a beautiful thing. Yeah. 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 And there's lots of ways of ways to feel queen without a king. I like that. Yeah. I like that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, interesting the way that you, and I've heard other people, I mean, I've heard actually David Wolf say something similar, Tony Robbins a little bit about the goal being to cultivate the end desired result of your emotional or mental Mm -hmm. sense, Mm -hmm. rather than getting caught up on the thing that's the Porsche that's going to then create that feeling. Like, let's just go straight to the feeling as a goal. Is that kind of where you're coming from with that? That's it. That's it. Yeah. God, that's so deep. So I don't know for some reason when I heard you say that in a video, I was like, oh shit. Cause I still often get caught up in, you know, the step, like the goal is the stepping stone to get me to that desired feeling. It's exhausting. It's exhausting that way. I know. Did it. Mm-hmm. Striving, want to get on the New York Times bestseller list, want to make you, you make your first million, then you want to make your next. Money is never enough. And the, you know, the saying we've all been like since the sixties that success is the quality of the journey. It is. And so you can't, you can't strive your way to peace. You can't please everyone. You can't market your way to feeling accepted. You got to be peaceful now and you got to be accepted now. Uh, Feel that acceptance with what's going on. So I'm actually not that goal oriented. I mean, the subtitle of the desire map is something about creating goals with soul. I know how I want to feel. And every day has got to feel that way. And I can come up with an idea for a project. We've got the resources. We think it would sell. (sighs) It doesn't feel light. It's a no. Mm. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's so cliche now, but I really just, I just want to be of service. I want to be in communion with the tribe and I, and all the other things that come with it. Like clearly I hope I'm smart about this. I've got like, I've got nine people, actually 16 people, nine full-time people and a handful of others that I take care of. Wow. And on your team? Yep. Damn. But the idea is... That's like mini empire. It's a mini empire. It's like Marie Forleo style. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's great. We are clear on why we're in business. So we've gone through a process of what's our purpose for money? Our purpose for money is that we are all well. Everybody on the team is healthy. That means everybody's paid competitively. Uh, My payroll amount is at 30% of my take, which is ridiculous. It should be more about 20%. 
some people say that's not so, it's working for me. Everybody's happy and healthy. So like if I can't create wellness or an environment for wellness for the people who are on the bus, who are giving 40 hours plus a week to my vision, then I'm an asshole. And then the next purpose for money is to hire the best people so we can be more creative. Then the next purpose for money is to take that creativity and be of service in the world to it. And then our, I think this brings us to like fifth reason, purpose for money, pure philanthropy. Well, how much are we going to give charity? And yeah, so it's not growth for the sake of growth. And I hit the wall last year professionally. I had, well, White Hot Truth came out. I did 24 cities that, by the way, I know you're wondering, it's 61 airplanes. Oh, man. It's a lot of airplanes. That's brutal. Yeah. And for your book tour. Yeah. And then I have my oh, usual Do you fly first class? No, fuck. That, what a waste of money. <laughs> to me, that's the most valid. That's the best spent money ever. I, li- I don't fly coach. And it's not to be fancy. What? I can't stand... Snooty fly- McSnooterton. No, no. It's about comfort. Like, honestly... Like oh. someone just asked me to do a talk in the- You're in not the, a you, giant. You can sit in a, premier. I am a giant. I'm, I'm freaking 6'2". Someone just hit me up about doing a talk in the UK and I was like, oh, I'm not that worried about the rate to speak. Like whatever, I'm not that famous yet. I said, I'm going to need a fancy flight straight up. Yeah. Like I'm not <laughs> flying to the UK on less than business. It's like so uncomfortable for me to not- Oh have, no, I have a and thing. I need, I need outlets to plug in all my devices. I'm, I'm, Sweetheart. I have a lot of attachments. Premier. You can get the outlets in Premier. Really? Just so you know, if you ever have to slum it, yeah. they give you water and they give you nuts. I would never drink water on a plane. <laughs> I've researched where it comes from. Oh, it's horrible. Do yeah. you know why it's so... Well, you tell me why it's so bad. Well, I, I learned this from a, a, a steward, a flight attendant, and uh, they have these big tanks of water that is, of course, tap water, right? But yeah. what they do is um, as the water gets empty before they fill it back up again, they wash the, the tanks inside the plane where the water is stored with all these crazy ass chemicals to disinfect it, which is nice. So you're not going to get Giardia, mm. but a lot of the chemical residue is left in the tap water. And the tap water itself is totally toxic if it came from any you know large mm. city, which most airports are in. So yeah. I heard the reason not to drink the water on a plane is because the shit tank is next to the water <laughs> tank. <laughs> and there's all sorts of cross Right, yes, right. That's, well, that's kind of like the, you know, when you have old pipes yeah. uh, coming in and out of your house, there's that cross contamination too. Interesting. But yeah, I'm not, I'm, it's not, I'm trying to be high maintenance. I literally just get so uncomfortable flying and I get so smoked from jet lag and travel fatigue. I'm actually making my first online course right now. It's oh, yeah. about hacking. It's called uh, biohackmytravel.com. It's mm. don't, no one try to look it up. It's not out yet. But because flying messes me up so bad, I'm devoting like a whole full on online course to help people get over it just because I'm so passionate about it. Are you sensitive? I am. I'm sensitive very, bunny I'm very, I am very sensitive. Absolutely, yeah. You should have that in your rider for events. Because like, due to sensitivity, must fly first I'm class. I'm telling you, straight up. I would, <laughs> I'll take a hit on like a fee for anything to just travel in style. Okay, so when it comes to being a loving, kind, compassionate mm-hmm. person that has empathy and really feels for others as I sense you do, how do you find a boundary to keep your autonomy for yourself and not to get into caring too much where you become a people pleaser or codependent in your relationships? Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, back to clarity of feeling. My philosophy is open heart, open tender heart, big fucking fence. Uh, Build the wall? (laughs) (laughs) Build my wall. So really clear on my boundaries on who I want to hang out with, how much I want to work, who I'm going to talk to, the podcast I'm going to do. I know what matters to me. My friends matter to me. Health matters to me. I have a 14-year-old son. I'm there at three o'clock to make a snack. Lots of positivity, being with people who are making a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. If you're not that, peace out. Yeah, it's simple. How have you you developed that that intuitive discernment where you... You said you feel into something and like you're like, it's a no. How, how do you or would, how would one really develop that mm-hmm. sense of knowing within yourself? Body knows before your mind does. Your body always knows. So I used to have a company, raised a bunch, Oprah called, raised a bunch of money. We'll go into the office every day. We had this great studio, very white. 
Lots of great artwork. You mean white people or white decor? Uh, lots of white decor. <laughs> it was very okay. white. I'm in Vancouver, so oh, okay. you're either Asian or you're white. Oh, okay. That's the extent of diversity in totally Vancouver. I totally not even kidding. I was like, what kind of white are you talking about? Yeah. And every day when I would open the door, I kind of feel this like hyperventilating. And I just thought, well, um, things are getting bigger and we're moving quickly and it's excitement. It wasn't excitement. My body was a no. So, yeah, and I think, you know, we do know, like we feel, we get the signals, we just override them. All the senses are there. Like the information is there. It's immediate. It's clear. We just deny it or we don't have the courage to follow it or we want to make the connection or we don't want the person. You meet somebody you think, they're lying. No, they couldn't be because, because, no, just follow that. And for me, it's like a yes is I feel expanded. I feel a sense of lightness. A no is I just kind of want to hold my breath. A no feels a little bit, it's a little bit gray. It's a little bit foggy. Mm -hmm. This is really important. I mean, it's really important to have anywhere, but it's especially important in our space with a lot of New age douchery happening. <laughs> like you've <laughs> totally. got to have totally. You know, just go to any tantra circle. Yeah. And if your douche meter is not on, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I just really. That's. A, I listen to the immediate. It's. I think yeah. it's there in the first eight seconds. Yeah, that's yeah. a beautiful description of that. It, I wasn't even expecting that thoughtful of an answer. That's really good. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I relate to that. I was kind of getting chills when you're describing that. So I've never quantified my method of discernment or really staying in mm -hmm. tune with my intuition, but that's it. It's sort of like a 51% yes. Just that 1% is enough for me to go, I'm in. 49%, mm -hmm. that 2% less is like, mm -hmm. I'm out. Why? I don't know. I don't like it. But just taking years to refine. Mm -hmm. Are you, at, and immediately I, I thought of uh, kinesiology, right? Mm -hmm. Are you at, perhaps uh, familiar with the work of David R. Hawkins? Mm -mm. author. He wrote a book called Power Versus Force. He, oh, yes. I've heard yeah. about him. I He's like on my list of things to research. <laughs> so give me the crash course. Well, he's my all-time favorite spiritual teacher and I've mm -hmm. studied a lot of them and they all have their thing. Uh, David Hawkins' most famous book is Power Versus Force, but he wrote a bunch of other books that are much more deeply spiritual, but that's kind of the one he's known for. And he was a really interesting guy. He was a psychiatrist in um, Long Island and New York City for like 55 years. Uh, he was also uh, a sober alcoholic for a long time. He was friends with Bill Wilson, the co-founder of AA, which is really interesting because he's, he's a really old guy. He died a few years ago. But one of the things he's most famous for, he's a teacher of non-duality. That's his thing, right? So he found that through, he was really into Course in Miracles too. So the Course in Miracles Beautiful. and the 12 Steps, but I really love both of those spiritual teachings. They're just very grassroots, very centered, you know, just, earthy kind it's of pared down path. the course yeah. is basic in the in a divine way yes yeah. so that's kind of his framework okay but what he did along the way he somehow discovered that you could use muscle testing or kinesiology to ascertain whether an idea or thought or feeling is true or not mm -hmm. so what you're describing you said the body knows well he started to notice that he, like he had a study group that was doing a course in miracles and he would muscle test them with like pesticides or mm. Um, you know, things that everyone knows are bad for you. And the people that were doing the Course of Miracles at that time would stay strong in the muscle test by holding like aspartame, you know, fake sweeteners or whatever toxins around them that would make any other person go weak in a muscle test. And he was like, what the hell's going on here? So he started to do further research and he discovered that you can actually use the human body as a tuning fork for truth to determine mm -hmm. between truth and falsehood. So he started to ask questions about spirituality and about history and spiritual books and teachings and philosophies and politicians and countries and everything else. And eventually did thousands and thousands of calibrations and developed what he called the scale of consciousness. And so there was a scale from zero to a thousand and like Christ consciousness, for example, would be a thousand. Like that's the top of the human realm of possibility. And then the lowest, like a six would be a pedophile, like, which is like lower than a lot of animals, you yes, know, yeah. a deer would be like a 200 or whatever. Right. So there's this beautiful scale of consciousness all based on your inherent kind of spiritual uh, vibration, you could say, right? Mm -hmm. And he would muscle test on people to determine 
things going on with them. And then later it evolved to him just being able to ask a question about the universe of any time and place. And point being, which goes back to what you're saying, is the body knows. Mm -hmm. The body knows if something's true or false. And mm -hmm. I think he said a 10,000th of a second. That's how fast mm -hmm. your biology re reacts to truth or falsehood, mm -hmm. which is just fascinating. So I went and down in that and we used to go see him speak in, uh, in Sedona and stuff. And I was really bummed when he passed away. And then years later I had a podcast. I was like, oh God, that would have been my dream interview. But it really helped me to tune into my body. And I don't really use his methods or kinesiology, but I do the same thing. Like I feel with my body is like, mm -hmm. I don't like this. What I do now. So that's beautiful that you, you know, illustrated it. And I, I got to get more into David. Right now I'm taking a bunch of homeopathics and different tinctures and stuff. And for me, this is a real example of, I've learned to just listen to myself. So I'm working with this homeopath, comes highly recommended. Her work is actually changing my health. I had mono last year. It was brutal. Oh, wow. it's, it's like, it's working, but still I need to be tuning into myself. Like nobody gets the whole say. And I stand at my counter with all my stuff out every day and I just hold my thing in my hand and I say, is this in my highest good? And if I just feel a little bit like my body is moving forward, I take it that day. And if I feel that kind of, it's almost like a little force field push where I step yeah. back. It also works for buying shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I ignored it the other day and ended up with a really crap sweater. Like, tuning in, like, hmm. That's great. <laughs> wow. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, I love the idea of really becoming your own guru, you know, and, yeah. and looking in, inside. I think we all really do have the answers to most questions. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. This show is presented by Onnit.com. I talk a lot about Onnit on the show because I've been using their products for years. I like the krill oil, the new mood, the alpha brain, the protein powders, protein bars, on and on and on. They have tons of great supplements and food over there. But they also just launched a super dope six-week online workout series created by John Wolf called Onnit 6. So in, in addition to the fitness, it incorporates diet tips and recipes, supplementation from my friend Kyle Kingsbury, who's like next level biohacker makes me look tame uh, in many ways. And then a mindset course from their founder, Aubrey Marcus, who has of course been a guest on the show. So the first course is about body weight and then there's going to be kettlebell and steel mace and clubs and all of this kind of stuff. So if you're sick of going to the gym, you can go over there and learn how to train yourself in all areas of your life. That's the On It 6 program. Really cool stuff. So make sure you get over to onit.com forward slash Luke. Now, if you're into the food and supplements, you're going to save 10% off of those. And for a limited time at onnit.com forward slash Luke, you can receive a 14 count bottle of Alpha Brain to try for free. But I would definitely recommend the six week online workout series. It's hardcore and it's very comprehensive. So I'm stoked that they're finally uh, putting their foot in the water in terms of the online course game because they have so much to offer. It's a really cool progressive company, more than just a supplement company. It's a full on lifestyle brand. I've been there. I've seen it in person. It's just a badass company all around. So go to onnit.com forward slash Luke to check it out. And now back to the interview. As you become more successful and widely known, how do you avoid the traps of thinking you're hot shit? Like, how do you stay grounded and stay down to earth and, and humble, even though to some people in the world, you're highly revered? Mm. Well, it's both. So I don't have any false modesty. I've, I've done my work. I'm generating as much light as I possibly can. I'm here to serve. I stand in integrity. I have a lot to offer. Full stop. Awesome. Yeah. And right alongside that, in equal measure, Suffer horribly. Same pain as anybody else. Not same. It's not about, I'm the same as you. It's, and of course, of course. And yeah, yeah. It's, and I don't, you know, I could give you like a list of, you know, the things that agonize me, but same struggles. Just want to have good friendships and does my ass look great in these jeans? And, and I've also been around the block enough to know that 
the number of people I have following my Facebook does not affect the quality of my life. There's lots of people in this space who are making millions, many millions more and get on the New York Times bestseller list. I'm showing up every day to do what I want to do. I sleep really well at night. You know, it's like, it was like so lovely to hear you say, I don't know if we were rolling, but it's like, you know, you're a good person. And on my dark days, you know, I just wrote a prayer for the program I'm doing called uh, Show Me How to Love Myself. And one of the lines is, on the darkest days, just tell me that I'm a good person and I deserve to be here. I don't know anybody, super famous, Oscar winner, gazillionaire, who doesn't feel that way. Yeah. So I also have a kid who keeps me in check. Like he's just so not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> You're still mom. I'm still mom. He and there's care still how many real Facebook life. followers you have. Yeah. And you know, I had a moment. I had a moment this winter. I live in Vancouver. It was snowing. Doesn't doesn't snow much. So for everybody who wonders, it can't. Can, all of Canada does not snow. We get FM radio. You know. Right. Um, <laughs> it was snowing, and my whole team was off for Christmas. It's really important for me to know at all times <laughs> that everybody's as fi- fulfilled as they possibly can be. It's fucking impossible as a leader that everybody is fulfilled, but that's part of my neuroses. Everybody happy? You good? You good? You good? You're doing it. So the team's off. So I feel like this deep sense of peace. They're relaxing. I can relax. I'm recovering from mono, which is ridiculous. If I thought mono only happened in high school in like 1988. Yeah, it's from making out it's in like high school. It's like crazy. Yeah. I didn't even get to like make out with anybody to catch up. <laughs> oh, that sucks. <laughs> it really sucks. Yeah. It's, it's almost worth it if, you know, at least there was some pleasure was at the beginning of that session. journey. session, yeah. And, the ch- and there was cello music playing. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do a really Virgo thing right now. I'm going to organize my spice drawer, which is totally ironic because I don't really cook. And I know my kid's safe. He's at school or he's at his dad's. And I just felt like this bliss. And the immediate thought I had after that bliss moment was, this is the same way I feel when I get off stage. And for me, that was like a personal marker. It's like, oh, I'm making a little bit of inner world personal development progress Mm -hmm. that this simplicity, I don't care who loves me that day. I probably didn't even post anything. Actually, I think I did post about my spice drawer is equal to, if not in greater measure to being adored for 15 minutes when somebody thinks you did something great on stage. Yeah. That's where I thought I'm, I'm doing okay. Yeah. I like that perspective and not getting too big for your britches and, you know, allowing that the trappings of ego to be like, ah, oh, you've made it, you're special, is that you started out your answer with like, I'm badass. I've done mm-hmm. the work. Like I'm worthy, mm-hmm. which some people would interpret as a lack of humility. But my understanding of humility is is more and more so becoming, because this has been a struggle for me, is actually owning my badassery and the work that I have done and that I am valid. And I'm doing something meaningful in the world. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really important part of that mm-hmm. inner experience. And in a weird way, that also keeps you grounded because you know, well, yeah, in a year, I'm going to be looking back on where I was now going, I didn't know anything. Now mm-hmm. I've really done the work. Do you find that you're continually to kind of up the ante for yourself in terms of your own self-worth and self-compassion and those kind of things? i in some ways. Just <laughs> really? like, I just want more simplicity. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I just want to keep things... Most simple. Yeah. What personal flaw are you finding that you have a hard time overcoming in your life right now? Well, personal habit is lack of sleep. (laughs) Personal flaw. I have a really hard time with customer service. I I am very, I have a very short fuse when it comes to not being treated like a queen. I just think you're in this job. You're here. You're in a position of service. So as a customer, you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Show up. Be articulate. Go the distance. Fix my problem. And I'll be kind about it. And I'll even talk to your manager about how awesome you are. And I hope you get a raise. But don't come on. Don't do the job unless you can love it. Unless you can, yeah. So I have I'm quick to 
be dissatisfied in certain situations. And I have a hard time with my temper in those cases. Like I'm never mean, but here's an example. I was at a, I was at a dinner a couple weeks ago and it was a sacred day. We were there for a sacred occasion. And for me, that means you're going to say grace. You're going to say some kind of thank you meal. And there's already this buzz happening around the table. Oh, we don't say grace. And, and I can kind of feel that fire happening within me and just like, what? We're not going to say grace today? And I said, and I was quite like serious and somber about it. And this is a part of myself I do not like at all. I'm just like, I think it's appropriate that we say grace. And I'm pretty forceful in that moment. Not cool. And, and, and after I leave that situation, I'm just like, why couldn't I like access my humor? Why couldn't I just say, guys, let's just say like a non-Christian fun. I'm going to go first. Right. But I couldn't. I couldn't get out of that serious forcefulness. It's not my favorite part of myself, but it comes in handy a lot as an activist. So, did you kill the vibe at dinner? Was everyone kind of like, oh, the energy got weird? You know, no, I think, you know, I was able to like lift the vibe, but I wonder if maybe a few people after dinner were like, did you see the, did you see the, <laughs> the grace stunt she pulled? Like, that was a little. Right. But I would venture to say <laughs> they were glad they said grace. We had a beautiful moment. Oh, I was just so a little bit of a your, bitch. So you about got it. yours. <laughs> That's cool. You got it in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got it in. Good, good. I wasn't leaving without yeah. saying grace. Yeah. I experienced the same thing with customer service, especially if it involves technology. Like computer shit's not working and you have to like chat or do something. Like <laughs> Mr. Meditator goes like, bye, out the window. I'm psychotic. Have you by chance read the book uh, Delivering Happiness about Zappos? Oh, Tony's book. Yes. Yeah, Long yeah. time ago. Yeah. 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 I just, I just yeah. read that and I was like, oh, interesting. Wow. Imagine if the whole world sort of adopted that. Your customer service customer could be service. a calling. Yeah. Just to cool. connect. Like, and, and back yeah. to the list of manners, the post I wrote that you were referencing. Yeah. One of them is, <laughs> I forget what number what, but you know, when you're having a customer service exchange, when you're in the position of service, don't say no problem afterwards. You know, you give me the money or the latte or whatever. No problem. After I say thanks, which it should be a problem. <laughs> yeah, it be, it's like already implied that it it's, shouldn't be a problem up front. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because it's funny. like a kind. It's kind of smug. It's a little too casual. Right. It's so beautiful to say, "You're so welcome." Yeah. Yeah. I noticed uh, one of the other manners once too was really acknowledging people that are helping you, like in customer service or something like that. And I just think, yeah, cool, thanks. But to really take the time. It, the, it goes from, both from, ways. Yeah, from the heart to say, listen, thank you so much for helping yeah. me. I do that like in Target and shit. I've already done a lot of the stuff. You know, I've, some of the things actually yesterday I was filming people without their permission. I was like, oh shit. I read your thing because I was walking around with my little Instagram live. And I was like, hey, by the way, you're on camera. And people are like, really? Wow, mm-hmm. ask first. But I really find I, de- I derive a lot of pleasure from going overboard with appreciating people just right. out in the world. And it's so cool because people are so surprised by that type of energy. When you really look someone in the eyes and just open up your heart and your body language and you just really, truly, not to be like Pollyanna, but you're like, thank you so much for like working at Target on your feet for fucking eight hours and yeah. wringing up my paper towels or whatever, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a really, it's a cool practice. And It's easy to be loving. It's it is. so easy to be loving if you want to be loving. Yeah. Yeah, I find that's like a really a great hack if I'm in kind of a pissy mood. I'll just go overboard on my own yeah. kindness and it's it's actually reverberates back fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh speaking of uh reverberation and kindness, when you go through periods that are dark, mm-hmm. you know, the the divorces, the breakups, the you know, the employees stealing from you, the you know, partnership folded, whatever. The things that happen, you know, physical problems, disease, someone dies, all that kind of stuff. When things are dark, how do you maintain faith in good? Mm. Let me bring in Stephen Colbert. So he had two brothers and his father who were killed in a plane crash. Comes from a really Catholic family. 
he went to his mother and said, how could God do this to us? And she said, you have to have the perspective of eternity. Uh, Damn. uh, 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 Mom's on point. Yeah. Which I would call the point of view of the soul. Right. So when I'm in the shit... My, the point of view of the soul is I believe that everything happens for a reason, that there's a divine order to things. And I have to test that belief in every area of my life. Is there a divine order to rape, to absurd immigration laws, to maniacal narcissists being in positions of so-called power, to the own, my own tragedies in my life? Yes. The response to anybody's tragedy is not to spiritually bypass it or intellectualize it or say that happened to you because everything happens for a reason. The response is deep as possible compassion and you do everything you can to to comfort, to heal. And if you're up for it, you fucking fight for justice. But I think everything happens for a reason. Part of what helps me have a soul's point of view and be in it for the long haul is that I believe that we're going to live multiple lifetimes in multiple incarnations, multiple dimensions. And so if I really fuck it up this time, I can clean it up maybe another time. The good that I'm doing now, if it's good, the integrity that I think I have, the like making the right choice might not have any payback this lifetime. But it's going into like the escrow of my soul. and. Even if it isn't going into the escrow of my soul, I'm doing, I'm taking what I think is right action for the sake of right action. And I've failed enough, like big fail, and been in enough pain that I know I survived. Like nothing has, nothing's killed me yet. Every disappointment, like I thought everything was fucking riding on this one thing. It never is. Nothing is ever riding on one thing. Yeah, everything I wanted that I didn't get, so, so glad I didn't get it. Thank you that I didn't get it. Yeah. You have a very Vedic perspective. Yes. Yeah. 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 I, th- I think of life as sort of like your lifetime is one episode of a TV series, you mm-hmm. know, and then within it, it's just like a moment and a moment and a moment in the plot. Mm-hmm. It's so difficult sometimes to not get plot up, caught up in those plot points of your little show and to forget that like, wait a minute, like this is just season one, you know, this is mm-hmm. episode one of season one. And there's like mm-hmm. an infinite number of shows that are going to be my incarnations. And that's the only way, honestly, I can reconcile life. Because if it's just this, this is bullshit and it's a raw deal. <laughs> there's, I, you know, there's got to be more. I agree. There's got to be and more. And you can get into this philosophical debate with people. To which, believe what you want. I honor it. It's your choice this lifetime. (laughs) It is my own righteousness. Well, you'll figure it out. You think you only live once? You'll figure it out in the next lifetime. But it's so much more comforting to believe that there's so many possibilities. And I don't, I mean, clearly, I hope it's obvious. I don't believe in a punishing God. I don't believe in favoritism. I don't believe in predeterminism. I don't believe in luck of the draw. Like there's, There's a reason, there's intention. And how do you, you know, this is another one of those beliefs that you need to test. You think you're going to reincarnate. You think you're going to try it out a few times. Well, why? And you think you just try it a few times? You think you could learn everything you need to learn in like five or six lifetimes? Really? No, you're going to be the victim. You're going to be the vanquisher. There's so much that your soul needs to experience and accumulate until you're whole or until you get to the next level. And I mean, there's so much I need to do to get home. And there's no way I get it done if I were just Cleopatra in my past life and Danielle in this life and a dude in another. Like, it's got to be infinite. It's also helpful from that perspective to not get too caught up in your gender, your race, like your body, your personality, That's your right. time this time around, you know, I find that I don't I don't get like 
how do I say it? Like inordinately uh, attached, attached to like a position on like, I need to stand up for men. It's like, well, I, how many times have I been a woman? Like it mm-hmm. could have been literally like a hundred years ago, I was in a female body. Like mm-hmm. not that long ago. Mm-hmm. We don't really know what happens You could be between. a female in a parallel universe right now. <laughs> totally, we don't know. Totally, totally. Yeah. Yeah. All the, you could like, be married the, to yourself in some other dimension. The interdimensional stuff too. Yeah. I love yeah. that perspective because I've you know suffered a fair amount of trauma at the hands of others in my life. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure I've screwed some people over too, mostly unintentionally, Mm -hmm. but that's how I've been able to reconcile those things is from a a karmic point of view. Like, Hey, I guess I kind of had it coming and it's not in like a self (laughs) work work with me on this. Cause I'd like to get your point of view. It's not in like a, Oh, I deserved to be abused. It's not like that. It's just like, cool. I got that shit over with. Cause obviously that was no accident. There was a divine purpose to whatever happened if nothing else, to catapult me into someone who's going toward God all the time because yeah. the opposite is so uncomfortable. Yes. But I, I've i found some <laughs> solace in that of going, well, not, you know, and it's, it sounds weird, like, oh, I deserved it or something. But karmically, I think that everything that's happened to me and then the times that I've been victimized served a higher purpose, mm-hmm. whatever that is. Does that fit into your framework or how would you contextualize when bad shit happens to you and you're quote unquote fits. innocent? I think there's another dimension to look at it from, which is what if before you incarnated within the inner worlds, you and whoever was your victimizer agreed? I mean, it was really on another dimension. It was completely intense. It was, it was set up. You map this out. I'll be the victim. You be the victimizer. You ready? Let's go. There's that. So in a sense, like a soul role play, like a long-term role play game yeah. to have a full expression and experience of all the different spectrum of human experience yes. and consciousness. It's a great way of putting from it. From good to evil. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. That's interesting. Soul contracts, if you will. Yeah. I don't know. I hear a lot about soul contracts. Ironically. I don't. I just pulled that out. That's good. <laughs> I don't know anything yeah. about it, but it sounds like a deal you make with someone like, hey. Let's help each other evolve in some weird ways as we move through these incarnations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. Do you have relationships in your life right now with people that you felt are your road dogs like long term that you, you know, you've known them for a long time and <laughs> yeah. it goes way beyond, oh, when we met 10 years ago? Yeah. Uh, I love the phrase road dogs. Yeah. My ride or dies. That's the yeah. new one. Ride or die is the new, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a deeper right, commitment. Right. It's a deeper commitment. Yeah, right or die is like, not only is it all good, like we're in this till the end. Uh, yeah. It's all good forever. I I do, yes. And like my girlfriends are my religion. So those relationships are everything to me. And I'm so much more flexible with my friendships now. Just more forgiving. Nobody, I just let people, everybody's got their shit and I've got my shit. and. You know, it's just like, she's like that. That's her thing. It totally frustrates me. But just she's just so beautiful and loving and she's addicted to chaos. That's her thing. You know, and, what's, and I got my thing. And so, yeah, there's just a lot more. I'm a better friend these days. Yeah. What's your current desires or vision in terms of having a romantic partner in your life? <laughs> a king would be great. I just ran into a friend yesterday. This is so cliche. I'm in LA to do a gig. I'm at the Creation Cafe getting a juice. Of course you are. In Beverly Hills. And I run into Rico. And I'm like, Rico, mono just fucked me over this year. But I got my body back. My mind's clear. I'm launching this new thing. I'm ready for the king. And Rico said, who's going to be big enough for you? I was like, don't say that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> don't let's not give that any right you know and it's a compliment but you don't want to put that out there yeah <laughs> yeah i like hot established up to good shit in the world and also you know that same kind of everybody's got their stuff i don't know i, I you know i would hope i know i have a maturity now that that is more yeah, different kind of softness. No, but my spiritual, my my clearest spiritual revelation over the last couple of years is that 
Spiritual maturity has so much to do with softness. And it doesn't matter if you're in a male body or a female body. There is, there's a friendliness that comes after you've been doing your work for a long time. Yeah. I, that was me segueing away from the question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very personal question, you know, and yeah. like always on my show, you know, feel free to, <laughs> to, to, to take the fifth, you know, in any, in any given case, I just, I, you know, I noticed that you said, yeah, I'm, I'm not with anyone and I'm, you know, yeah. building this queen energy. And so naturally the void there would be a king. Mm-hmm. Have you, without having to directly implicate any particular person, do you feel at times along your path of development that you've settled for relationships or a quality of person that was, sure. I don't know, I don't want to say beneath you, but because you didn't quite like own that queen yet that you were like, ah, you'll do and ended up with someone that wasn't maybe well, serving your highest good. Totally. Everybody does that. And I think you learn through contrast. You know, I have gone through the perfect new age woman on the path, empathetic, Notice I'm not saying empath, but empathetic. And that personality can attract people who just don't have their own light show going on and just want to feed. And it's a perfect storm because the female, whoever identifies as being divinely feminine in that case, wants to give more because it's a spiritual thing to do. And they're going to take more responsibility for the share of the relationship. The loving thing to do in this is this. It's just their family of origin stuff. I need to go to more yoga and open my heart chakra. I should, be, I should just be more fucking Buddhist about this situation. And what's happening is you're actually just in this parasitic dynamic. Yes, the answer is yes. Yeah. yeah. And do you feel right now you're ready? You feel at a good place? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And how do you, how, yeah. how would you find room to still dominate and crush it? Yeah, it's like I'm hitting on you right now. I'm totally not. I'm just like, and the next thing. No, I'm. I, and you're type in six foot two. Does that work for you? Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a Scorpio. Uh, but no, in all seriousness. I won't say anything about Scorpios. As, as someone, yeah. I can tell you a lot about Scorpios. We're, we're an interesting. Uh, you're very an, oral. I will tell you breed. that. Yeah. That's interesting. I think yeah. that's true. In both ways. Yes. Personally. Yeah, that's true. I, wow. That could open up a whole other yeah. type of conversation we don't have time for. No, I, I, I'm i kind of prying there because of course I'm relating everything to myself and where I'm at in my journey now is I've taken quite a long break from any of that. I'm working on my career, but more than anything, I'm working on building my king and mm-hmm. becoming ready for mm-hmm. the type of situation that I feel is most fulfilling and meaningful for, for both people, mm-hmm, you know, because mm-hmm. in the past, I think I've, I don't know, I just lacked self-worth and self-esteem and just, it wasn't thoughtful in many cases about how I entered into things and got out of them. And so it's interesting to use the word contrast because that's the experience I've been having, having, you know, nine months of distance now at this point, yeah, about nine months, over nine months. Uh, there's a lot of contrast in looking at some of the past relationships that I've been in and my my end of it and their end of it and going like, oh my God, how did I ever fucking put up with that for myself or from the other person? Mm. And now I'm like, oh my God, my standards just for myself and my own behavior and my own integrity are so much higher mm-hmm. that I can feel my requirements for anyone that's going to enter into my world are fucking high in, a, think, in a healthy yeah. way. I think it's really important to take that break and to put yourself in your own metaphorical desert. I think right. not enough people do it. I never have. I'm just like, oh, oh this hurts. Let me find someone new so it doesn't yeah. hurt anymore. <laughs> like yeah. That's how I get over shit. Histor- used to, historically. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of David Data. Yeah, for okay. sure. So Data believes that you're going to grow more in relationship than you will outside of relationship. I disagree with that. I think the relationship fast, I, it's just so healthy. Like I want to, I am at a point in terms of romantic relationship. I don't need it, but I want it. That's cool. I like that. Right? Like yeah. I'm, there's so much love in my life. I'm ha- right. I feel sexy 24 seven, great friends, free. It happens when it happens. And, it's the 
I don't want to say oh, it's the icing on the cake, but I'm solid. And for me, the journey has been about holding out. Right. It's not an ex- I'm not a right. fucking experiment. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like, yeah. you know, not to equate a human with a material object, but I think of it as, it's like if you were shopping for a house, you know, something that's that meaningful and that yeah. impactful on your life, you're yeah. not just like, Oh, that one, two bedrooms. Yeah, yeah, that's just fine. I'll just take that one. It's yeah. like, no, man, you look at a lot of houses and it takes a while. You yeah. know, I think that's also, a- and also to keep going with the house metaphor, you don't want to do the work of like moving in and not working. Like, I don't want to have to clean up the mess. <laughs> you don't want to have to do a ex- remodel. <laughs> that's right. I want to have to renovate. Right. right. You'd be like, yeah. he'd be great if we just made a few nips and tucks here and there. Yeah, no, yeah. there's no more changing, trying to change people. On that note, as we come to a close, being a prolific and successful, productive businesswoman as you are, I'm just assuming that based on your public profile, like you got a lot going on, all these programs and books and you're everywhere, 60 airplanes, all this stuff. How do you, while you're being so seemingly proactive, how do you stay in touch with that queen and that feminine energy, presuming that that's the energy that you would want to predominantly uphold in the context of a relationship? Well, I'm clear. I want to predominantly be that Mm -hmm. no matter what. Oh, interesting. So I'm not. So you don't turn on like your man, you know, your uh, masculine energy to like crush it and make money at work. You're actually using. Oh, no. Okay. I want to be, I want to be rocking my femininity, my inclusivity, my intuition, my fluidity at all times. Hmm. I also want to be a whole person. So there's times for me to pull out the sword and negotiate and. I love getting from A to B. There's a vision. There's a strategy. Let's execute. Right. Zing. So do you sense, you, I guess what I'm sensing from you is you have a fluidity and you you have enough self-awareness sure. to kind of know which energy you're predominantly activating at any given moment then. I don't separate or do you not it. Even I don't think, think about, about it. it. I'm just like, I'm going to be me. Uh-huh. I'm going to be as loving as possible. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do the work to be clear-minded. Clarity, clarity, clarity all about discernment. In order to be that clear, I eat clean. I'm intentional about intimacy and I'm a meditator. Oh, I wanted to ask you about that. Yoga. Right. I do the do. do. Right. Yeah. Cool. That's good. So you're not over analytical about it. Oh God, no. Yeah. I think I'm interested in such things as energy. You mentioned uh, David Data and I'm on board with most of that. But having been someone that's predominant, I mean, I'm very emotional and artistic and intuitive and creative and like, Mm -hmm. I'm very in touch with my feminine, Mm -hmm. but earlier in life, especially when I was in the throes of addictions, I would take on that role in a relationship and it was horrible for both of us, you know? So you were the woman in the relationship? Yeah. When I was like, yeah, like when I was in my twenties and I get these always older women that were like 10 years older and they would become like a mothering, controlling, Uh, like masculine energy. So there was polarity, but then eventually we both got grossed out and resentful and it would all blow up. Right. And then I kind of was like, well, fuck this. I need to like find my, my inner fucking man. And then I did that for a number of years, kind of through my thirties and was probably like way too much that way. Mm. Perhaps even to the misogynist degree a little bit, you know, although I think I'm a pretty feeling awake person, but I was crushing it there for a minute. And now I'm sort of like finding that balance again where I'm like, oh, you know, I'm definitely in touch with my creativity and stuff, but there's no fucking way in a relationship that I'm going to be like, oh, honey, eh," like, and be, you know. What's that mean? Oh, honey. eh." (laughs) That means like, I feel the most centered in polarity where I'm predominantly engaged in my masculine energy and Mm -hmm. I'm really able to hold that space and have stability and integrity within Mm -hmm. my body, within my breath, within my whole being. I love that feeling. Mm -hmm. And I love the feeling of the feminine just blowing up and falling apart and changing and being fluid. And I just love holding space for that. Mm -hmm. Feels really, really centered and grounded for me. Mm -hmm. But I also want to be able to be in touch and not become a stoic and like, or, you know, mm-hmm. so anyway, mm-hmm. but I love your, you're not like thinking about it. You're like, dude, I'm just being me. Mm-hmm. I think I kind of analyze it because I've, the extremes of going either way have been painful for me and probably other people at times. So I'm like very conscious. And I think, um, maybe a bit, um, 
hyper vigilant about that awareness because I'm like, okay, where am I right now? And maybe mm. too much so. Maybe I just need to just be me. And it's sensitive times. It is. Yeah. It is. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So you mentioned you meditate. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what do you have a particular practice that you do? A style? A whole bag of tricks. I'm a meditational mutt. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So I work a lot with light and color. Oh, interesting. And visually speaking? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I try and sit every day. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's like 11 minutes. And other times, you know, like I, I love a good Sunday session. It's life changing, it's everything. It is everything. It's everything. What would you say to yeah. someone who feels as though they should apply meditation to their lifestyle and thinks that I can't do it, I'm not a meditator, it's too hard? Where would you recommend someone go with that? You have not found the right meditation for you yet. Mm. It's like riding a bicycle. You got to find the right bike, the right gear. You want a clip in? Do you want the fat ass girl seat? You want the... <laughs> Just find the right bike. Oh, that's great. And you'll want to ride, you know? Right. Yeah. So my my practice is, it's a bit of everything and it has zero to do with suffering or discipline. Mm. And I think that's the bad rap that meditation has got. And I think a lot of that, there's a reason for that. There's a lot of truth in 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 what's being put out there in terms of, sit and be stoic. And I appreciate my ego. I don't want to escape my mind. I want to work with my mind. I don't want to sit in Lotus and fucking criticize myself about what I'm not doing. You know, I don't want to criticize because of thought has floated by. I want to see things and feel things. And I had a conversation with one of my many shrinks years ago, who was a high, I would say he was a, he was a devoted practitioner, he's a mm-hmm. Buddhist. And I said, why do you meditate? And I thought I was going to get this really esoteric answer from him, non-dualism and duality. And he said, eh, gives me comfort. <laughs> right. I thought, oh, yeah. So I meditate for comfort. I meditate for clarity, for mental cleanliness. I, med- I meditate to purify and I meditate to serve. I try and hit all those notes every day. That's beautiful. What a lovely conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So great to finally meet. Yeah, you too. Yeah. In closing, you've taught me a ton today. I've learned a lot, honestly. I'm going to listen back to this one and learn more. So, you know, when you're interviewing someone, it's like I'm learning as like as if I'm sitting down and you're my teacher, right? Mm-hmm. But I also have to think of the next question. Yeah, you got to so, keep yeah. it going. Yeah, yeah you got to like, yeah. you know, you got to kind of have a container there. But I've learned a lot and our listeners have learned a lot, those viewing live and those that are going to hear this later on. Who have been three teachers or teachings that you might recommend mm. people go to further upstream from you? Krishnamurti, Jiddu, J-I-D-D-U. Krishnamurti, uh, Truth is a Pathless Land. Eve Ensler is one of my personal heroes. So Eve created the Vagina Monologues. She oh, I've a, heard of that. I remember when that was playing on La Cienega some years ago and I was like, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> is that a little playhouse or something? Yeah, so the play gets picked up and performed across okay. the world. And you can go to vday.org and support her work for ending violence against women and girls across the world. Cool. Uh, teachers, Pema Chodron, P-E-M-A Chodron. Nice. Just really accessible, sweet approach to hardcore Buddhism. Yeah. 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 She's one of my, she's on my dream list of uh, interviews, but she does very few of them. Oh, good luck. I'm, yeah. Brother, I'm not, she ain't coming. I, she's not coming out of the Abbey yeah, for you. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm holding out. She's on there. I did Sharon Salzburg. That was pretty close as far as the Buddhist mm. teachers go. So cool. Thank you for those recommendations. We'll put those in the show notes as we do everything that we discuss that's linkable. Uh, tell us about your websites and social media. Where can people find more I'm of everywhere. you? I'm everywhere. Center of my world is Instagram. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me yeah. today. Thanks, Luke Star. Well, my soul brothers and sisters, that brings us to the end of another episode of the Lifestylist Podcast. And I hate to say I told you so, but I told you this was going to be a badass episode, right? What a fantastic woman, Daniela. She gives me hope in mankind. I love that there's teachers out there like her that are able to keep it so real, so authentic so applicable, so relatable. 
you know, taking the woo-woo, taking the mystique out of spirituality and the guilt out of personal development about self-acceptance, acceptance of others, and being strong and staying on the path. I'm loving it. Go listen to her podcast, buy her books, support what she's doing. She's an awesome woman. I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to sit down with her. I'd like to also give a shout out to Angela Hartman, who made this interview possible at the Longevity Now conference. I was the official podcaster there, and I got to do so many great interviews like the one you just heard. So let's talk about next week's episode. We're going to be talking about the power of crystals with Energy Muse, number 162. Can you believe it? Creeping up on 200 episodes here in this year of 2018. And then I've got a couple upcoming events. I mentioned them in the intro, but I know some of you fast forward the intro, you little sneakers. So I'm going to hit it with, hit you with it right now. We've got Mercado Sagrado, the, the best hippy dippy crazy ass festival in Los Angeles. It's the ultimate destination. That's October 13th and 14th. I will be presenting my biohacking lounge where I'm going to space out a few hundred people. I will also be doing a talk there. Then I'm flying out to New York City to speak at Whitma Live on October 25th. Another great event. There'll be tons of panels and a lot of people in the consciousness scene hanging at that one. And then I'll be celebrating my birthday on October 27th at Rama, New York City on the Lower East Side, where I will be presenting my first ever spiritual workshop. We're going to do some breath work, some kundalini yoga. We're going to get down. There's probably going to be tears involved. Yeah, I can honestly pretty much promise that. Lots of laughter, some tears, some great music. Bring a cushion, bring a yoga mat. This is not like a sit down in a chair kind of thing. We're going to be rolling around, getting freaky in there. That's Rama, New York City, October 27th. If you want to gain entry to any events that I'm participating in, that is so easy. All you have to do is go to lukestory.com forward slash events. That's lukestory.com forward slash events. And who knows, by the time you hear this, there could even be other events that didn't make it into this recording. You know what I'm saying? I'm booking stuff all the time. I'm going crazy. And then I'd like to thank our sponsors. Oh man, without our sponsors, none of this would be possible, guys. It's just the way it is, man. I find these great companies that make health technologies and health products and things like that. These are all things that I use. In fact, the first one I'm going to give a shout out to right here is my friends over at Juve Red Light Therapy. I'm literally staring across the room at my Juve unit. It's hanging on my closet door in my man cave slash biohacking podcast studio here. And I encourage you to uh, get over to juve.com and check them out. You can also find them on Instagram at juve social. That's J-O-O-V-V. And then my friends at Four Sigmatic, you can go to foursigmatic.com forward slash Luke story. I just had some of their instant coffee this afternoon because I was in a hurry and I was tired. I put some uh, coconut creamer in there, threw it in the Vitamix and had kind of, uh, it wasn't an iced coffee and it wasn't a hot coffee. It was a lukewarm coffee. That's what it was. But that shit was hella good. Go to foursigmatic.com forward slash Luke story, enter the code Luke story, and you can save yourself 15% off some instant coffee, some medicinal mushrooms, the chaga, reishi, lion's mane, cordyceps, the whole deal easy little travel pouches. I'm taking a bunch of those to Colorado, going on a little vacation tomorrow. Uh, by the time you hear this, I will be back in LA, but I'm leaving tomorrow to go visit my pops and go visit some hot springs and get outdoors. And I'll be bringing my Four Sigmatic with me, yo. Okay, then we've got On It. Ah, my friends over at On It. That's onit.com forward slash Luke. If you use the code Luke at onit.com forward slash Luke, you'll save 10%. On it has a slew of amazing products. One of the things that I really like that they have, I also use this for my little on the fly instant coffees, is their flavored MCT uh, coffee creamers. Really good stuff. And then, of course, Alpha Brain for cognition. I mean, they just have tons of stuff protein powders. They have really great coffee as well, uh, free of mold, free of whackness. So there you go, Juve Red Light Therapy. That's juve.com, foursigmatic.com, forward slash Luke Story, onit.com, forward slash Luke. That's O N N I T. And I think that's it for the plugs. Uh, I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. I'd also like to thank you for supporting the sponsors. 
Unless you're a podcaster, you probably don't understand how this works, but it's, it's very expensive to put out a high quality uh, podcast with great sound editing and graphic design and the YouTube video and maintaining a website and sending out newsletters and doing all of the things that us podcasters uh, do, or at least the ones that do it like I do it. So in order to bring you high quality shows, we got to get some cash from the sponsors. You know what I'm saying? And the sponsors don't give up any money unless you guys buy stuff. That's the way it works. The rad thing is you get the best of the best because I pre-vet every single advertiser and you also get discounts. So I know so many of you support our sponsors because they keep buying ad space, which is great. I try to make the ads, by the way, you guys, as unannoying as possible. I hate listening to ads. I'm sure many of you do too, but it's just the way it goes. You know what I'm saying? Now, once I'm independently well healed enough and I can just do this podcast as volunteer work uh, and just do it you know, out, of, out of seva, as we say, uh, maybe I'll do that. Well, I did that for the first six months, actually. I'm not doing that shit again. Come to think of it. It's too much work. Anyway, I'm rambling. I will let you go. I love you from the bottom of my heart. Be kind to yourself today. Be patient to yourself today. And chances are you'll treat others Uh, in the same way. So enjoy. And I'll see you next week for the episode with Energy Muse all about crystals. This episode of the Lifestylist Podcast was produced by podcastmasters.net. 